The ASUS TUF FX505DU gaming laptop has received a lot of attention due to its price point and unusual combination of AMD CPU and Nvidia graphics. So let's take a detailed look at this machine and help you decide if it's a laptop you should consider. Starting with the specs, I've got the DU model, which has an AMD Ryzen 7 3750H quad-core CPU, 80 watt NVIDIA GTX 1660 Ti graphics, and 16 gig of memory running in dual channel. There's a 512 gig NVMe M.2 SSD for storage, and a 15.6 inch 1080p 120Hz IPS level screen. For network connectivity, it's got gigabit ethernet, 802.11 AC Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth 5. There are a few different configurations available though, such as with GTX 1650 or 3550H CPU instead. You can find updated prices to different models linked in the description. The whole laptop is plastic, but feels quite solid. And like other Tough series laptops, it does meet military grade standards ensuring toughness and durability. I've got the gold steel version, so the lid is a dark grey matte with orange ASUS logo. But there are also the stealth black and red matte versions. The interior is also black plastic with a brushed finish, and all edges and corners were smooth. The weight is listed at 2.2 to 2.3 kilos on the ASUS website, and mine was closer to 2.2 kilos, but I don't have a 2.5 inch drive installed. With the 180 watt power brick and cables for charging, the total rises to just under 2.8 kilos. The dimensions of the laptop are 36 centimeters in width, 26 centimeters in depth, and just under 2.7 centimeters in height. So a little on the thicker side, but honestly not too bad. I've just reviewed a lot of thin machines lately. The smaller width allows us to have thinner screen bezels, though the bottom chin is larger. The 15.6 inch 1080p 120Hz IPS level screen has a matte finish and good viewing angles. No G-Sync available here though. I've measured the current colour gamut using the Spider 5 Pro, and my results returned 63% of sRGB, 45% of NTSC, and 47% of Adobe RGB. At 100% brightness in the center, I measured 284 nits with a 930 to 1 contrast ratio. So a little below average on the brightness, with color gamut on the lower side too. Not surprising, many gaming laptops in this price range have similar panels to keep costs down and they're perfectly acceptable for gaming. There was some backlight bleed, the section down the bottom left corner was occasionally noticeable while viewing darker content, though results will vary between laptops and panels. There was only a bit of screen flex, the panel felt sturdier than I was expecting considering the plastic build, and the hinges being out towards the far corners further aid with stability. It wasn't quite possible to open up with one finger, as there seems to be more weight towards the back, but no problem using it on my lap though. The 720p camera is found in the middle above the screen. The camera is pretty average for 720p, it looks okay but not great, while the microphone sounds alright, and here's what it sounds like when you type on the keyboard. The chiclet keyboard has RGB backlighting which lights up even the secondary key functions, although it can only be controlled as one single zone, so the effects are limited. The WASD keys are clear and easily identifiable. The arrow keys were a little narrower but still easier to press than say the Dell G5. The right shift size isn't sacrificed and the spacebar is a little longer on the left for gamers. Overall I liked typing with the keyboard, here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. There was some keyboard flex when intentionally pushing down hard, likely due to the plastic chassis, but this is a worst case. It's mostly fine during normal use, but sometimes a bit of slight movement when typing aggressively. The touchpad has precision drivers and was smooth to the touch. It worked alright, but it felt a bit loose. If you lightly press it, it sort of clicks down before you get to the actual click. Fingerprints and dust show up on the black plastic interior. I found them easy to wipe off, but it could be hard once dirt gets into the grooves of the brushed finish. On the left we've got the power input, gigabit ethernet, HDMI 2 output, USB 2.0 Type-A port, two USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-A ports, 3.5mm audio combo jack, and left speaker towards the front. On the right there's the right speaker towards the front, air exhaust vent, and Kensington lock so no I.O. that will get in the way of your mouse hand, assuming you're right handed. The speakers on the side sounded okay, a bit muffled at higher volumes, though they seem to get loud enough at maximum volume with music playing, and the latency mod results looked alright. On the back there are just air exhaust vents towards the left and right corners, and the fins appear to have been painted red, while the front has nothing at all. 
The status LEDs are found towards the back above the keyboard, and they can be seen when the lid is closed. On the grey plastic lid, there's the ASUS logo in the centre, which lights up orange from the screen's backlight, so cannot be customised. Underneath there are minimal air vents, more on that in a moment. And the rubber feet did an acceptable job of preventing movement while using the machine. The bottom panel can be easily removed by taking out 11 screws with a Phillips head screwdriver. The 5 towards the front are shorter than the 6 towards the back. Once inside, from left to right, we've got the single M.2 slot, battery, two memory slots, and single 2.5 inch drive bay. My model actually came with single channel memory. However, as you can purchase it with dual channel, I've tested with dual channel for optimal performance. Powering the laptop is a 3 cell, 48 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled, and all keyboard lighting off. While just watching YouTube videos, it lasted for 4 hours and 58 minutes, a decent result. And it was using the Vega 10 graphics rather than the more powerful NVIDIA 1660 Ti. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and NVIDIA's battery boost set to 30fps, the battery lasted for 1 hour and 9 minutes. However, the game only ran at 15 to 20 FPS the entire time. It didn't seem like there was adequate power to reach the usual 30 FPS in this title. By default on battery power, the laptop goes into the silent profile, but even changing it to balanced didn't see this improve the result. I'm not sure if the 180 watt power brick is enough for long term gaming. After half an hour, the battery had drained from 100% to 95% while plugged in and playing Watch Dogs 2, but performance didn't seem to be affected. I left it going even longer but didn't see further change. Let's move on to the thermal testing. On the bottom of the laptop there are some air vents, however these aren't actually above the intake fans. If we look at the panel on this angle we can more easily see where the vents are located. There also appears to be some air vents just above the keyboard, and the lid apparently has this cut out to reduce it covering the air exhausts when open. In terms of heat pipes, we've got the standard two shared pipes between processor and graphics, so a change in temperature of one will affect the other. We can pick between three modes in the Armory Crate software, silent, balanced and turbo, and I'll note which is in use throughout the testing. Basically, these just affect CPU TDP limits and fan speed. These modes can also be toggled by holding the function key and pressing F5, the one with the fan icon. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, so expect different results in different environments. I've tested idle down the bottom with the silent profile enabled, and it was fairly cool. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads and are meant to represent worst case scenarios. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. The stress test results shown on the lower half of the graph are from running the A-64 CPU stress test and Heaven GPU benchmark at the same time to fully load the system. I've tested these with either the balanced or turbo profile in use. Basically turbo boosts the CPU TDP and increases the fan speed to help with cooling. Let's start with the stress test results on the lower half of the graph. I wasn't really seeing a difference in terms of thermals with either the turbo or balanced profile. But once we add the Thermaltake Massive 20 cooling pad, it was possible to lower the temperatures a little. The cooling pad made less of a difference than usual due to the bottom panel having minimal air ventilation holes. Moving up into the gaming results, I was getting a slightly bigger improvement to thermals with turbo mode enabled, but again almost no difference with the cooling pad. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. Whether under stress test or while gaming, we see the largest improvement to CPU clock speed by enabling turbo mode. This is because it boosts the CPU TDP from 30 watts in the balanced profile to 35 watts. More power typically means more heat too, which is why we didn't see much change in the temperature graph previously, despite the fans going faster, as you'll hear soon. I did not notice thermal throttling during any of these tests. However, there appears to be power limit throttling on the CPU while under combined CPU and GPU loads, at 30 watts on the CPU when in balanced mode, or 35 watts in turbo mode. While the 80W 1660 Ti was showing as sitting at 80 watts under load and hardware info. No CPU undervolting was done as that doesn't seem to be a thing with these AMD mobile chips at the moment. There's no utility available to do it. The TDP reported in hardware info seemed incorrect too. I used AMD's UProf tool to measure that here. These are the average clock speeds while under a CPU only workload. With the turbo profile enabled there was just a slight boost, getting to 3.9GHz on all four cores in this test. The turbo profile only lowers the temperature by 1 degree though. The fans get faster, but the CPU TDP rises as a result. 
from 30 watts on balanced to an average of 33 in turbo mode. To demonstrate how this translates into performance, I've got some Cinebench CPU benchmarks here. Turbo mode was only giving a little improvement. As we saw earlier, we're getting similar performance with either mode in CPU only tests. Here are the results from the newest Cinebench R20. And again, a little boost with turbo mode. I'll be comparing the 3750H against a number of other CPUs in future videos, so if you're new to the channel, get subscribed for those. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was about average, except for a warmer spot a little right from the center. While gaming with balanced mode, it was still quite cool. However, that hot spot was quite warm to the touch, getting to the mid 50s. With the stress tests going, there was a similar result. If it wasn't for that one hotspot, this would be quite impressive, but still nice that the WASD keys are cool. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle with the silent profile, the fans were just slightly audible. While gaming or under stress test in balanced mode, it was just a little below average when compared to other gaming laptops I've tested. With turbo mode enabled, the fans go to maximum and get a little louder. But nothing too crazy, again similar to most other laptops. Overall, the ASUS FX505DU gaming laptop doesn't get too hot. Well, at least compared to the Intel laptops I'm used to dealing with. I honestly haven't compared too many other Ryzen based laptops yet, so I'll have more data to compare with in the future but we're not getting to high 90 degrees under load, which seems good. I wasn't observing any thermal throttling in my tests. The CPU power limit appears to be hit in turbo mode at 35 watts, so a power limit throttle as per the spec of the 3750H CPU. The only strange thing was the bottom panel of the machine having minimal air ventilation. That was a bit weird. I suppose it wasn't required in the end. I think it could have been improved more by having more and better positioned vents, and this is why our cooling pad doesn't seem to help much. Next, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. I've tested these games with these NVIDIA drivers and all available Windows updates installed, with the turbo profile in use for best performance. We'll start off by looking at all setting levels, then compare with some other laptops after. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode and not in multiplayer mode, as it's easier to consistently reproduce the test run. The results here seemed fair, and it was definitely playable with ultra settings with above 60 FPS averages possible. Apex Legends was tested with either all settings at maximum or all settings at the lowest possible values, as it doesn't have predefined setting presets. It played fine even with everything at maximum, though dropping down to minimum boosted FPS by 41%. Far Cry New Dawn was tested with the built in benchmark. In this test, 55 FPS averages were hit at ultra settings. Honestly, not all that far behind some higher spec options. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and this game runs well on pretty much anything. At ultra settings, it was still possible to reach above 100 FPS in this test, with decent 1% lows, with higher still possible at lower settings. Overwatch is another well optimized game and was tested in the practice range. Again, even at epic settings, the average FPS is great for the 120Hz panel, with above 100 for the 1% low. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with a built in benchmark. I don't have too much 1660 Ti laptop data yet but even the Infinity S I recently tested which was hampered with single channel memory was a little ahead here, showing that the more powerful i7-9750H CPU is going to make a difference in many titles. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and I retested this game after some comments on my previous video covering gaming performance to find it got a little better performance than before, so I must have messed up one of the settings. Regardless, the frame rates are still quite high from this test. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built in benchmark, and as a game I found a benefit from Nvidia's new Turing architecture. Like some of the other well performing games, this one generally always does pretty good on modern hardware. PUBG was tested using the replay feature, and in this game I saw no major differences between the different setting levels. In terms of average FPS, there was only around a difference of 5 between very low and ultra, with inconsistent 1% low results. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was tested with the built in benchmark, and seems to be quite a CPU heavy test. So overall, results are a little down over the recent Intel laptops I've covered. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane with an average amount of action going on, and it played well without any noticeable issues. 144 FPS averages were possible with low settings, while Ultra was still above 90. Watch Dogs 2 is a resource intensive game, however with a solid 30 FPS, to me it plays fine. 
so even with ultra settings, with our 31 1% low, I had no trouble playing. Doom was tested using Vulkan, and this game saw the first problem with the AMD and NVIDIA hybrid laptop. By default, Vulkan games seemed to want to use the Vega 10 graphics instead of the GTX 1660 Ti, so I could only get Vulkan to work by disabling the Vega 10 graphics in Device Manager. Anyway, once I got it working, we were able to hit around 100 FPS at ultra settings, it was running very well. Strange Brigade was another game that was tested with Vulkan, and like Doom, this one would error and not run unless I disabled the Vega 10 graphics on the AMD CPU through Device Manager. After that, it worked without issue, with 90 FPS averages at ultra settings possible in this test. The Witcher 3 was running well with Hairworks disabled. Even with ultra settings, to me it was playing perfectly fine with an average 70 FPS while still looking great. I've tested 19 games in total on the ASUS FX505DU in the dedicated gaming benchmark video. Check the card in the top right corner if you're after more results. Let's also take a look at how this config of the ASUS TUF FX505DU compares with other gaming laptops to see how it stacks up. Use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. In Battlefield 5, I've got the FX505DU up the top in red. And like I said before, it's performing quite well, still above 60 FPS at Ultra. While it doesn't look too good here comparatively, keep in mind the newest 16 series graphics only just launched for laptops so I don't yet have that much other data to compare with. And again, it's worth remembering the Infinity S7 was tested with single channel memory, but despite this, it's performing better, presumably due to the higher tier 9750H CPU. Here are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built-in benchmark. In this one, the FX505DU is ahead of the S7 with single channel memory, and while lower than the rest of the higher end machines I've tested, the result is still decent. These are the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the built-in benchmark at highest settings. And well, yeah, it's in last place again, but that's only because I've been sent higher spec machines lately. I know you guys want to see lower to mid-range options and I'm trying to get them. Unfortunately, I don't have too much say and just get what I'm given. But there are more 1650 and 1660 Ti laptops here to test, so don't worry. Overall, the gaming performance from this machine was quite good. This is the first time I've tested the 1660 Ti in a laptop with dual channel memory, and with an AMD CPU, so I don't yet have much other data to compare with, but I'll build up more data over time, so stay tuned. Sure, the performance in many games here isn't quite as high when compared to many other laptops I've recently tested, and the 1% lows in CPU heavy titles are lower as the 3750H seems to be more of a bottleneck. However, when it comes down to it, all of these games still felt fine while actually playing. While I was initially skeptical of the AMD and Nvidia hybrid, overall it worked well, and I admit better than I was expecting. With the exception of my two Vulcan titles as previously discussed. Though even without my workaround, both games still ran fine without Vulcan, so hopefully that bug gets fixed. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley, and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy, and VRMark from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. As we saw earlier, we've got the option of making some changes to improve performance, so let's see how these changes actually help in gaming. Far Cry 5 was tested using the built-in benchmark at 1080p. At ultra settings, there was a 5.6% improvement to average FPS when using turbo mode rather than balanced, and a 7.3% boost to 1% low. Interestingly, I actually got worse results by overclocking the GPU by 100MHz on the core and 500MHz on the memory, likely as it was power limit throttling at stock. Standard stuff for these new Turing graphics. I tried undervolting the GPU, but still got around the 66 FPS mark. I've used Crystal Disk Mark to test the storage, and the 512GB NVMe M.2 SSD was performing alright. Pretty good reads, but lower on the writes. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, in the US the ASUS TUF FX505DU gaming laptop is going for around $1100 US dollars though this one has half the SSD storage but an additional 1TB hard drive. The 1650 version is also available for $200 less, while the 560X is even lower. Here in Australia, we're looking at around $1700 Australian dollars, though this one at M-Wave is available with $100 cashback. So what did you think about the ASUS TUF FX505DU gaming laptop? It seems to be providing good value for money. Even in the top end configuration I've got here, it's still in a similar price point to the previous 1060 models but performs better than the 1060, but I'll be comparing the two in a future video. 
With these specs, as we've seen, it's capable of playing pretty much any modern game at 1080p even with higher settings. Yes, the 1% low performance is generally lower when you compare it to an Intel based gaming laptop, but honestly just playing the games and not looking at the raw data I didn't notice anything. The games all played well. The Intel i5-8300H does perform a little better than the Ryzen 3750H. So if you have the option of getting that CPU for the same price, it's probably a better pick in most cases in terms of performance improvement. Aside from the game performance, the battery life was also quite good considering the battery size, although the performance in games while on battery power was lower. The things I didn't like would include the strange loose touchpad which felt a little weird at times, but not a problem if you'll be sticking to a mouse anyway. The Vulkan issues with the AMD and Nvidia configuration might be annoying in some games. But even if the game only supports Vulkan, you can work around this by manually disabling the Vega graphics. Or otherwise, most of these games also support DirectX, which works fine. But this is something I'd expect them to fix with future drivers anyway. Aside from these issues when specifically using Vulkan, all games were stable and had no problem switching from Vega to Nvidia graphics. The cooling for the laptop was pretty good, though it could probably have been further improved with some better placed vents underneath. The laptop came to me in single channel and I see it selling with both single and dual channel options. I really wish gaming laptops would stop being sold in single channel, but you can always upgrade yourself later. The screen looked okay and it worked well overall. I didn't find any major issues outside of what was just covered. We seem to be getting a capable gaming machine for a fair price. So with all of that in mind, let me know what you guys thought about the ASUS TUF FX505 gaming laptop down in the comments. And let me know what comparisons with it you want to see. As always, if you're new to the channel, make sure you get subscribed for future tech videos like this one.